Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. I have a series of notes here, and on the back of the notes, on my notes, I, I started writing down uh, what Sir Charles was saying as well, so I hope I don't confuse my notes and start repeating what he had to say, because it was, uh, it was I, I think everybody in the, in the audience, my guess, would be, was writing, taking a lot of notes to, uh, uh, to, to what he had to say, because it was very, very interesting. It's uh, very pleasant to be back here in Scotland once again. I visited Scotland many times, and I, after the conference is over, when I go back to Edinburgh for a few days, I hope to play a little golf, uh, always presuming that the uh, Scottish weather will uh, cooperate. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint presentation today. Uh, a little guilty about that now, but... <laughs> <laughs> How, However, I, I have to say in, in, uh, in defense, my PowerPoint consists solely of photographs. So, uh, Sir Charles, I'll ask him afterwards if, he, uh, if, uh, if, if that was okay. I do have uh, three topics for my presentation today. I have 35 minutes to uh, discuss them all, and uh, my clock is running. So let let me tell you about my topics for today. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background and tell you something about the Chemical Safety Board. Then I'll spend a few minutes on the results of CSB investigations, focusing on the Deepwater Horizon case. And finally, I'll give you my observations on some of the common process safety sa uh, failings that I've seen in industry and then share my thoughts on how I believe industry can improve their process safety record. You'll see a blank presentation from time to time as I, uh, that's, not a, that's not a problem with the machine, it's, they're blank on purpose. First, let me tell you a little bit about my background and experience. I, I grew up in Northern Ireland, and after completing my university education, I was offered a job in West Virginia in the United States by the company now known as Honeywell, but back then it was known as Allied Chemical. I remained with Honeywell for 35 years, working in several locations in the United States and with assignments in process engineering, environmental control, manufacturing, plant management, uh, including as the plant manager of what was then the largest uh, phenol and acetone plant in the world. I retired from Honeywell in 2000 and when I retired, I trained for and became an emer a voluntary uh, emergency medical technician in New Jersey, close to New York City. Um, don't be confused by that, and if you uh, have a heart attack this, this morning, uh, I will not be there to, uh, to work on you, which is, you're probably happy to hear. In 2002, I was appointed by President George W. Bush to be a board member of the U.S. Chemical Safety Board, or CSB. I stayed with the CSB for 10 years, two five-year terms as a board member and as the chairman and CEO. Last August, I resigned from the CSB and became a research fellow at the Mary Kay O'Connor Process Safety Center of Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. So now that I'm retired, I have three jobs. Uh, one is with Texas A&M. I also do some consulting work, helping companies with their process safety programs. And I really enjoy talking to audiences like this about my experiences in industry and government and encouraging them to focus their energy on the safe operations of their facilities. If I, if I can make a small difference and help save someone from injury or death, or help a facility avoid a catastrophic accident, I feel that I've accomplished my mission and paid back a debt to society. Let's talk about the work of the United States Chemical Safety Board. The CSB is an independent United States federal agency. Independent meaning it people 
frequently asked me, or used to ask me, well, who do I work for in the Chemical Safety Board? And the, the sort of cynical answer that I gave was, as an independent agency, that I don't, I don't work for anybody. But the, the reality is you work for, you're appointed by the president, but you work for Congress because Congress are the, they're the organization, organization that sets the rules and regulations, and they also give you the money to do your job every year. It is a non-regulatory agency. It investigates process accidents in oil refineries and chemical plants. And by non-regulatory, I mean it does not write regulations on process safety for the chemical and refining industries. Those regulations are written by the Environmental Protection Agency or by OSHA. Basically, it investigates what I call incidents in those industries. Now, incidents to me it seems like a very trivial word for some of the accidents that I've seen, and the multiple fatalities and the catastrophic da uh, damage, but I have trouble coming up with a, with a better word than incidents. I don't like to call them accidents because they're not accidents. From the CSB investigations, root causes are developed and recommendations are issued to the facility, the company, trade organizations, and regulatory agencies like EPA or OSHA. And it was, it was interesting uh, in my experience dealing with, with OSHA, they were never all that enthused about getting, regula uh, getting recommendations for us because generally that meant more work for them to, to write the regulations. The CSB also prepares a video describing the incident and the root causes. And you may have seen some of these videos or downloaded them from the CSB webpage. They are used worldwide as training tools. So let's talk about some of the major CSB investigations. Let's go back to a date that you probably remember quite well, March 23, 2005. There was a catastrophic explosion and fire at the BP refinery in Texas City, about 40 miles south of Houston. 15 workers died, most of them in a trailer close to the explosion. Many others were injured, and I'm sure you all remember that terrible accident. I was there with a team of CSB investigators the day after it happened. Five months into the investigation, the CSB made two urgent, two urgent recommendations. The CSB makes recommendations at the end of their investigation, makes recommendations at the end of their investigations, but when they see something that needs to be dealt with immediately, they make urgent recommendations. The first one was that, BS, that BP should form an independent panel to evaluate its refinery safety management systems and its safety culture. BP complied with that CSB recommendation and the outcome was the Baker panel, headed up by former United States Secretary of State James Baker III. The Baker panel recommendations on safety culture have had a significant impact on the industry. They also made 10 recommendations to BP, including several on safety culture and process safety leadership. If you haven't read the Baker panel report, it's certainly, it's still available and it's well worth reading. The second urgent recommendation made by the CSB was to the American Petroleum Institute. That recommendation had to do with the safe placement of occupied temporary trailers inside an oil refinery. If you look at this photograph, you can see approximately in the middle of the photograph the skeleton of the trailers that were left, the skeleton that was left after the explosion took place and where the employees died. API has complied with that recommendation and in my visits to oil refineries and chemical plants, I would be very disappointed to find occupied trailers anywhere close to a potentially dangerous location. These two CSB recommendations are making a difference in the safety of the chemical and refining industry in the United States. 
And I hope they're having the same effect in chemical plants and oil refineries around the world. By the way, BP Texas City Refinery has been sold to Marathon Petroleum Corporation. And Marathon has changed the name of the refinery to the Galveston Bay Refinery. I've talked about the BP Texas City incident. Fast forward five years to another BP incident, the Deepwater Horizon incident of April 20th, 2010. Between the two incidents, 26 lives were lost, many more workers were injured, and the incidents have cost BP multiple billions of dollars and untold damage to its reputation. The CSB became aware of the Deepwater Horizon explosion the evening that it occurred. And following normal procedures, a CSB management meeting took place the following day to decide should we deploy to that incident and start an investigation. I was the chairman of the CSB at the time, and after a comprehensive discussion among our senior management folks and our investigators, we decided not to start an investigation. There were two reasons for this decision. One was I felt the CSB did not have the expertise in the offshore that we had in the onshore refining and chemical plant investigations. The second reason was that there was some uncertainty about the legal authority of the CSB to perform investigations in the offshore. However, as you well know, investigations were started by a number of organizations, notably the U.S. Coast Guard, the National Commission, the National Academy of Engineering, U.S. Justice Department, and the U.S. Congress. Most of those investigations have been completed, and their reports are publicly available. However, about six weeks after the explosion and fire, on June 8, 2010, the CSB received a letter from the Energy and Commerce Committee of the United States House of Representatives asking that the CSB carry out an investigation of the Deepwater Horizon blowout. The CSB responded on June 18th, agreeing to start the investigation. We followed up on June 28th, asking for additional funding of $5.6 million to cover the cost of what would prove to be a very long and detailed investigation. Uh, I believe the CSB is still waiting for the $5.6 million, and I, I'm not optimistic that they will receive it. That, the CSB investigation started, and it does continue. And I'm not in a position here today to talk about the details of the investigation not being a member of the Chemical Safety Board anymore. But in my conversations with them, I've been told that the final report is in draft form, and after appropriate revisions and review by the board members, it will be made public at a meeting in Houston in December of this year. And among the topics to, to be discussed in the report are safety management systems, safety culture, safety metrics, and offshore regulations. There will also be recommendations in the report. One of the reasons for the delay in the CSB report on the completion of their investigation is that the CSB has had a legal dispute with Transocean, the owner of the rig, the owner of the rig that exploded. Trans Transocean has refused to cooperate with the CSB's investigation, claiming that the CSB does not have jurisdiction to investigate offshore incidents. This was taken to court, to federal court in Houston, and on April 1st of this year, just about a month ago, a federal judge in Houston decided that the CSB did have the authority to investigate the Deepwater Horizon explosion. Transocean is appealing that decision so we'll have to wait to see what happens next. But you probably know that in January of this year, 
Transocean agreed to pay a $1.4 billion fine to settle criminal and civil charges resulting from the explosion and the subsequent oil, fill, oil spill. Looking back at these BP incidents, a question that I all frequently ask myself is, how did a company with virtually unlimited resources manage to have two catastrophic incidents within a six-year period? Especially given the lessons learned and the CSB recommendations that followed Texas City. It's a subject that I find very perplexing. You in the audience may be asking the same question, and you should be. But the more important question for you today is, how can your companies, financially successful major companies, avoid the incidents that nearly destroyed BP? You need to answer that question for yourselves. But I suggest you look at ExxonMobil for a contrasting example. ExxonMobil had a company-altering event in 1989, the oil spill from the Exxon Valdez in Alaska. That's a photograph of the Exxon Valdez uh, after the oil spill. That incident had a dramatic impact on the operations of ExxonMobil. It resulted in the installation of an Operations Integrity Management System or OIMS program everywhere within ExxonMobil. And I've been told by independent observer, ob observers that that program is one of the best, if not the best, operations program in the industry. Let's talk about the reality of a major refinery or petrochemical incident in today's world. Assume there is a disastrous accident at one of your facilities in the United States or in Europe. People have been killed and injured. The community around your plant is in an uproar. In your office, you will have police, fire departments, safety agencies, environmental agencies, local and national TV coverage, insurance companies, and maybe even a few lawyers probably more than a few lawyers. You just don't know how devastating a major fire or explosion can be until it happens to you. Sit down with your staff and calculate the cost of a major accident. And as the old saying goes, if you think safety is expensive, wait until you have a major accident. I know firsthand what this is like. On March 9, 1982, I was working at the Allied Chemical Phenol Plant in Philadelphia, which was the largest phenol plant in the world. On that day in March, the plant exploded. You can see the photograph of the damage here. It caused appalling damage. The next day in my office, I had at least eight different environmental and safety agencies wanting to know what happened. The Chemical Safety Board was not there because it did not exist then. No report on the incident was ever made public. I have the Allied Chemical report in my files at home. If the CSB had been around in 1982, I believe there would, be, there would have been some very interesting recommendations coming out of their investigation of that incident. And I think the thing that struck me, for those of you who have not experienced something like this, is how, in a fraction of a second, a facility that is running normally, looks normal, straight up and down, in a fraction of a second, it can be changed to something that looks like a bowl of spaghetti, with hopefully nobody being injured, but probably serious injuries and possibly fatalities. Obviously, you don't want, and I hope you will not have, such a catastrophe. So leaving aside BP and Allied Chemical, and thinking about the chemical and refining industry in general, let me speak to some of the common failings that I saw 
during my 10 years at the CSB. First of all, I'm going to classify process companies into three categories. And I know I'm being simplistic here, but please bear with me. My first category would be those companies that just don't understand the concept of process safety. Just completely don't understand it. I saw some of them during my time at the CSB. I have in my hand here, if you can see it, little containers of sugar. We use sugar every day. Yet this material, sugar, can be explosive under the right conditions. In February of 2008, the Imperial Sugar Factory in Savannah, Georgia, had a sugar dust explosion. The explosion destroyed the plant, killed 14 workers. Our investigation found that housekeeping at the sugar refinery was abysmal. No one was paying attention to the hazards of sugar dust. The company CEO, who had recently been hired, was visiting the facility at the time of the explosion and was very fortunate not to have been killed or seriously injured. Following the accident, following the investigation, he became a very effective national advocate for safer operations in sugar refineries. Another example of companies that don't understand process safety was our investigation of multiple fatalities at a metal powder facility in Tennessee. Now, I know the people here have worked for companies with strong safety programs. And what I'm going to tell you, you'll probably find hard to believe, but it did actually happen. Two employees died from metal burns, metal powder burns in January of 2011. Another one was burned in March of 2011. And three more employees burned to death in May of 2011, all in a plant with fewer than 200 employees. Sadly, some died after lingering for weeks in the hospital. During that CSB investigation, I met with the families of the deceased employees. It was a very distressing meeting. They just did not understand the hazards of combustible metal powders even after a first accident and a second accident. But there's just no excuse for not understanding the hazards of your operations. In my time at the CSB, I saw a number of companies that truly did not understand those hazards and had serious fires, explosions, toxic gas releases, injuring and killing employees. That's the first category of, of, uh, of companies. My second category would be companies that really understand the concepts of process safety. They have the right programs in place. They try hard to make them work. But in spite of all of that, they still have incidents, some minor and some catastrophic. I believe that these types of companies are, are, in, the, are in the majority. And you could probably look around the room and yourself and say, I know a company like that. I know it must be very perplexing for the senior leadership of those companies they put the right people and programs in place. They have good training and education programs, but they are still having serious accidents. Not only are the incidents causing property damage, injuring employees, but they have a very negative effect on the finances and the reputation of the company. And then my third category of companies would be those that truly understand the, the concepts of process safety. They have excellent programs and people, and they do not have any serious incidents. I know that you can name a few examples of companies in that category. You should find out what they are doing right and try to emulate them. So what are some of the failings that I've seen in my years in the industry and with the CSB? The first would be a lack of emphasis on the, the, emphasis on the proper issues and values that define a safety culture. As you know, there are two aspects to safety in the process industries. One is personal safety, slips, trips, and falls, and the other is process safety. In its investigations, the CSB has seen a number of companies that put their emphasis on personal safety while virtually ignoring deeper issues 
that involved process safety hazards that eventually and tragically led to low probability but high consequence accidents. Is the company focusing on slips, trips and falls at the, at the expense of attention to process safety? That's what we found at BP Texas City. The employees who were killed in the work trailer had just come back from a lunch celebrating an excellent personal safety record. In your business, you have to pay attention to both aspects of safety, in the upstream and in refining your operating facilities of enormous complexity and which require never-ending attention to details. Simple mistakes can kill you, a spark in the wrong place, a seemingly innocuous combustible dust, improper control of refined of confined space. Another failure I've seen is a lack of recogn recognition of the hazards of operations. A company has worked with a chemical or a process for many years, yet they don't recognize that under certain conditions, the process can be extremely dangerous. So how do you avoid that catastrophic incident that kills and injures your employees, causes widespread damage within your facility, results in a prolonged shutdown, gets your name splashed all over the newspapers and television, involves you in endless litigation, and may ultimately destroy your company. Here are my accident suggestions, gleaned from many years of overseeing chemical plant operations. First, hire the right people and educate people who understand your processes. Make sure those processes are designed, built, and operated in the safest possible way. This means both your management staff and your frontline operators and mechanics. I always found it incongruous that a company will invest billions of dollars in a refinery or a chemical plant, and yet for 16 hours every day, it is operated by workers who have excellent skills and motivation, but may not have the technical background to totally understand the complex details of the operation. That's why labor force education is so important. I can't say that enough. Note, I don't say training, I say education. The next slide may confuse you a little bit, but there is a, there is a reason for it. Uh, this is not me at the end of the US Open last week. Uh, this is in Cambodia. I played golf there about six weeks ago uh, at a course uh, d designed by Nick Faldo. And what I'm saying, what, the point I'm trying to make here is there's a, there's a young female caddy standing beside me. And that female caddy uh, comes from the local town, probably from a, a, a relatively poor background, maybe a very poor background, doesn't speak any English, but has been trained for six months to be a caddy. And she was the best caddy I've ever had in my experience. Again, she didn't speak very much in the way of English, but she was able to use the right, she, she learned the proper terms. She could tell you exactly where, it, where to hit the ball. Uh, she, occasionally, she would say to me, excellent shot, but more times she would say, your ball went in the water, or, <laughs> or it's in the bunker. And while I was there, I, I, while I was playing, I noticed a group of young Cambodian females walking across the course, and it looked like they were taking a shortcut across the golf course. I said, who are they? He said, that's our cadre of new employees who are going to start the, tr the six month training program that they go through. So you can train anyone if you work hard enough at it. And in this case, they worked very hard at it and had excellent results. Not only is education important at the operator level, but the Chemical Safety Board has recommended that chemical engineering curricula include education and process safety in their undergraduate programs. And I'm happy to say that this recommendation is being implemented. The recommendation came out of an explosion in a small privately owned chemical plant in Jacksonville, Florida. It was owned by two chemical engineers. One of the engineers was among the four people killed in the explosion. So my overall comment to you on training is please continue to make sure that you have the highest possible skill level in all of, your pe all of your people. Rule number two is to have leadership committed to process safety. If you're a senior leader in your company at the executive level, 
be a role model. But leadership moves all the way down through the organization, right down to the, the shop floor. Take every opportunity to discuss the importance of process safety to your business. Make sure that employees are accountable for their process safety performance. Get out and visit facilities. Walk around, spread the message of safe operation to all of your employees. Talk the talk and walk the walk. Don't call the plant three weeks in advance and say you're going to visit. Drop in unannounced. Talk to the front line people. Find out what they're thinking. You may be surprised. I sometimes wonder if senior leadership at these huge, oper huge corporations forget that they're managing a process industry. If you're managing a process industry, then the most important skill needed in your operations is process safety expertise. Third rule, don't be complacent. Don't get complacent. Just because you've operated safely for 30 years, it does not mean that tomorrow won't bring a disaster. I hope you sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and worry about what could happen in one of your, one of your plants. On December 31st, your year is over. You've met all of your goals for finance, and production, and safety. What do you do on January 1st? Do you relax, take a vacation? No, you don't. You don't get complacent. Fourth rule, details, details. As you and I know, a petrochemical plant or an oil refinery is a very complex entity. It requires constant and never-ending attention to details. Every day, a million details must be correct to ensure the safe operation of your facility. A Boeing 747 has six million parts overall, 350 gauges and lights in the cockpit. Every one of these parts is important to the safe operation of the plane, but thankfully they have backup. This is an actual 747 landing in, I think, in St. Martin, so if you're interested in coming close to death, you can stand uh, underneath the, uh, the plane as it arrives. Hopefully it doesn't uh, come in just a little bit lower than that. I don't know how many parts there are in an oil refinery, but every one of them can be a potential problem. So take care of all of the little details before they become big problems. Don't let deviances in procedures become normal. At the CSB, I saw that all too often. So-called small fires and releases come to be to treat, treated as normal occurrences that could be dealt with on a weekly or daily basis. Yet no one stops to analyze, why are they happening? And what are the consequences? Someday, maybe years away, the releases become larger and the explosion is catastrophic. And you also have to hold your people accountable for complying with your operating standards. Let's talk about metrics, a very common topic these days. It's always been easy to measure the number of first aid cases and lost workday cases. And those measurements have been very effective in driving down the number of personal injuries. But are you, are you measuring and reporting on your process incidents? For example, the number of unplanned emissions, number of leaks or spills. These are the lagging metrics, the ones that tell you about events that have already happened. What about the leading indicators? Those which will predict that you're going in the wrong direction on safety and could be headed towards an incident. For example, are your operating procedures up to date or do safety critical instruments perform to spec whenever they're, whenever they're tested? You have to measure both leading and lagging indicators. My next rule for avoiding accidents saving lives, avoiding negative newspaper coverage and public opinion involves the issue of risk. When I was in operations, I always faced the issue of risk. Someone comes to me and says, we have a problem. A piece of the equipment is failing, and if it fails, there could be a safety or an environmental concern. You have to shut the process down to fix it. If you shut down, you will lose production. Your boss will not be happy. If your facility is an oil refinery, the price of petrol will go up. The politicians will complain. Your choice is to shut down and face the wrath of your boss or keep it running and risk a safety or environmental issue. As a corporation, you need to develop a culture of taking the long-term view in a situation like that. 
A shutdown will be over in a day. Your boss will understand, you hope. A major safety or environmental problem will cost lives and equipment damage and certainly get you on TV and in the newspaper. People may be injured or killed. You will have to last, live with the consequences the rest of your life. In the real world, perhaps it's not as black and white as that. It can be a bit murky. But when you are faced with that risk benefit dilemma, I hope that you will err on the side of caution and safety. Give your employees stop work authority so that they become motivated to do the right thing. But what if you have an incident, a fire, multiple injuries? Is your, in your business, you have to be prepared for such an eventu eventuality. And you have to be able to mount the best emergency response possible, both inside the plant and in terms of out your outside emergency responders. Get to know your outside emergency responders on a first name basis. Practice your emergency response in the real world. The next time a company executive visits one of your facilities, have him or her visit the local fire department and say hello to the fire chief. Tell them that you are ready to work with them and support them. Finally, I would advocate that you learn from other industries. They probably have some good ideas that you can use. One example comes to mind in the US, and that is nuclear power. After the Three Mile, inc Three Mile Island incident in 1979, the nuclear in industry realized that they could not afford to have another incident like TMI. One of the actions they did was to form the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations in the United States. Uh, INSPO's mission is to promote the highest level of safety and reliability in the operation of, of commercial nuclear power plants. A similar type operation in the refining industry, the chemical industry, I, I do believe would be very valuable. So let's look for a moment at a more recent incident in the United States, one that I believe that has very interesting questions for the refining and chemical indus industry. On the April 17th of this year, there was an explosion at a small fertilizer plant in the town of West Texas. Tragically, 12 emergency responders, firefighters, were killed, in addition to three members of the public. That day, I was in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and I watched the CNN coverage of the explosion with Judith, Judith Hackett, who was at the same conference. We heard estimates of casualties as high as 60. What exploded? It's generally accepted that it was, an ammonium nit it was ammonium nitrate stored at the facility. After the plant was closed for the day, a fire started. The fire department responded. And 25 minutes later, there was an explosion. Three weeks ago, I visited the the, the site with five PhD students from Texas A&M University. And I think what was most sobering on that day was the extent of, extensive damage done to homes and schools and the enormous emotional and financial burden suffered by local residents. Several questions arise from this tragedy. Did the local community know about the storage of ammonia nitrate so close to their homes? And you can see in the photograph the explosion site is in the lower part of the, of the photograph, and the school is on the left, lots of homes in the upper side, and a nursing home in the upper middle that was severely damaged. Should the homes have been allowed to be built there? What did the fire department know about the hazards of ammonium, ammonium nitrate and the possibility of an explosion? Ammonium nitrate is a common fertilizer ingredient in the US. What about the many other facilities in the agricultural areas of the United States that store ammonium nitrate? And thinking in a broader sense, what are the implications for the oil and chemical facilities that store and use hazardous chemicals? I believe there may be hearings in Congress, and I was invited to testify on this. I got a phone call last week. I'm not sure when those hearings are going to take place, but uh, there certainly will be some hearings in Congress about this overall issue. So to summarize my recommendations, hire and educate the right people, 
show leadership in process safety, emphasize to your employees that your business is a process business and a business with hazards. Excellence in process safety is key to the, the continuing success of your company. Plan for emergencies. What would an incident cost is certainly cheaper not to have an accident. Take the long view with risk. Measure both your personal safety performance and your process safety performance and don't fall into the complacency trap. Think about Union Carbide and Bhopal. Think about Piper Alpha and the 167 deaths. Think about Texas City, Deepwater Horizon. Remember the unsinkable Titanic, Titanic that left Southampton 102 years ago. Keep focusing on preventing an accident like one of those. Is it rocket science? Yes, it is. You're working in very complex facilities, and they have to be managed with great care and with the ultimate at utmost attention to detail every day. Your employees and your communities depend on you to do the right thing. And please remember that your community gives you the ultimate license to operate. I wish you continued success. And I thank you again for inviting me today.